15,000 Useful Phrases, a practical handbook of pertinent expressions, striking similes, literary, commercial, conversational, and oratorical terms, for the embellishment of speech and literature, and the improvement of the vocabulary of those persons who read, write, and speak English, by Grenville Kleiser. Introduction the most powerful and the most perfect expression of thought and feeling through the medium of oral language must be traced to the mastery of words. Nothing is better suited to lead speakers and readers of English into an easy control of this language than the command of the phrase that perfectly expresses the thought. Every speaker's aim is to be heard and understood. A clear, crisp articulation holds an audience as by the spell of some irresistible power. The choice word, the correct phrase, are instruments that may reach the heart, and awake the soul if they fall upon the ear in melodious cadence. But if the utterance be harsh and discordant, they fail to interest, fall upon deaf ears, and are as barren as seed sown on fallow ground. In language, nothing conduces so emphatically to the harmony of sounds as perfect phrasing, that is, the emphasizing of the relation of clause to clause, and of sentence to sentence, by the systematic grouping of words. The phrase consists usually of a few words which denote a single idea that forms a separate part of a sentence. In this respect, it differs from the clause, which is a short sentence that forms a distinct part of a composition, paragraph, or discourse. Correct phrasing is regulated by rests. Such rests do not break the continuity of a thought or the progress of the sense. Grenville Kleiser, who has devoted years of his diligent life to imparting the art of correct expression in speech and writing, has provided many aids for those who would know not merely what to say, but how to say it. He has taught also what the great Holmes taught that language is a temple in which the human soul is enshrined, and that it grows out of life, out of its joys and its sorrows, its burdens and its necessities. To him, as well as to the writer, the deep strong voice of man and the low sweet voice of woman are never heard at finer advantage than in the earnest but mellow tones of familiar speech. In the present volume, Mr. Kleiser furnishes an additional and an exceptional aid for those who would have a mint of phrases at their command, from which to draw when in need of the golden mean for expressing thought. Few indeed are the books fitted today for the purpose of imparting this knowledge, yet two centuries ago phrase books were esteemed as supplements to the dictionaries, and have not by any manner of means lost their value. The guide to familiar quotations, the index to similes, the grammars, the readers, the machine-made letter-writer of mechanically perfect letters of congratulation or condolence, none are sententious enough to supply the need. By the compilation of this praxis, Mr. Kleiser has not only supplied it, but has furnished a means for the increase of one's vocabulary by practical methods. There are thousands of persons who may profit by the systematic study of such a book as this, if they will familiarize themselves with the author's purpose by a careful reading of the preliminary pages of his book. To speak in public pleasingly and readily, and to read well, are accomplishments acquired only after many days, weeks even, of practice. Foreigners sometimes reproach us for the asperity and discordance of our speech and in general this reproach is just, for there are many persons who do scanty justice to the vowel elements of our language. Although these elements constitute its music, they are continually mistreated. We flirt with and pirouette around them constantly. If it were not so, English would be found full of beauty and harmony of sound. Familiar with the maxim, take care of the vowels and the consonants will take care of themselves a maxim that, when put into practice, has frequently led to the breaking down of vowel values. The writer feels that the common custom of allowing the consonants to take care of themselves is pernicious. It leads to suppression or to imperfect utterance, and thus produces indistinct articulation. The English language is so complex in character 
that it can scarcely be learned by rule, and can best be mastered by the study of such idioms and phrases as are provided in this book. But just as care must be taken to place every accent or stress on the proper syllable in the pronouncing of every word it contains, so must the stress or emphasis be placed on the proper word in every sentence spoken. To read or speak pleasingly, one should resort to constant practice by doing so aloud in private, or preferably in the presence of such persons as know good reading when they hear it, and are masters of the melody of sounds. It was Dean Swift's belief that the common fluency of speech in many men and most women was due to scarcity of matter and scarcity of words. He claimed that a master of language possessed a mind full of ideas, and that before speaking, such a mind paused to select the choice word, the phrase best suited to the occasion. Common speakers, he said, have only one set of ideas and one set of words to clothe them in, and these are always ready on the lips. Because he holds the dean's view sound today, the writer will venture to warn the readers of this book against a habit that, growing far too common among us, should be checked. And this is the iteration and reiteration in conversation of the battered, stale, and trite phrases, the like of which were credited by the worthy dean to the women of his time. Human thought elaborates itself with the progress of intelligence. Speech is the harvest of thought, and the relation which exists between words and the mouths that speak them must be carefully observed. Just as nothing is more beautiful than a word fitly spoken, so nothing is rarer than the use of a word in its exact meaning. There is a tendency to overwork both words and phrases that is not restricted to any particular class. The learned sin, in this respect, even as do the ignorant, and the practice spreads until it becomes an epidemic. The epidemic word with us yesterday was unquestionably conscription. Several months ago it was preparedness, before then, efficiency was heard on every side and succeeded in superseding vocational teaching, only to be displaced in turn by life extension activities. Safety first had a long run, which was brought almost to abrupt end by strict accountability. But these are mere reflections of our cosmopolitan life and activities. There are others that stand out as indicators of brain weariness. These are most frequently met in the work of our novelists. English authors and journalists are abusing and overworking the word intrigue today. Sir Arthur Quillercouch, on page 81 of his book, On the Art of Writing, uses it. We are intrigued by the process of manufacture instead of being wearied by a description of the ready-made article. Mrs. Sidgwick, in Salt and Savor, page 232, wrote, but what intrigued her was little Mama's remark at breakfast. From the parliamentary news, one learns that Mr. Harcourt intrigued the House of Commons by his sustained silence for two years, and that London is interested in and not a little intrigued by the statement. This use of intrigue in the sense of perplex, puzzle, trick, or deceive dates from 1600. Then it fell into a state of somnolence, and after an existence of innocuous destitude, lasting till 1794, it was revived, only to hibernate again until 1894. It owes its new release of life to a writer on the Westminster Gazette, a London journal famous for its competitions in aid of the restoring of the dead meanings of words. One is almost exasperated by the repeated use and abuse of the word intimate, in a recently published work of fiction by an author who aspires to the first rank in his profession, he writes of the intimate dimness of the room, a fierce intimate whispering, a look that was intimate, the noise of the city was intimate, etc. Who has not heard the idea? What's the idea? Is that the idea? Yes, that's the idea, with increased inflection at each repetition. And who is without a friend who at some time or another has not sprung meticulous upon him? Another example is afforded by the endemic use of of sorts, which struck London while the writer was in that city a few years ago. Whence it came, no one knew, 
but it was heard on every side. She was a woman of sorts. He is a Tory of sorts. He had a religion of sorts. He was a critic of sorts. While it originally meant of different or various kinds, as hats of sorts, offices of sorts, cheese of sorts, etc., it is now used disparagingly, and implies something of a kind that is not satisfactory, or of a character that is rather poor. This, as Shakespeare might have said, is, Sod in business! There's a stewed phrase indeed! Footnote. Troilus and Cressida, Act Three, Scene One. End footnote. The abuse of phrases and the misuse of words rife among us can be checked by diligent exercises in good English, such as this book provides. These exercises, in conjunction with others to be found in different volumes by the same author, will serve to correct careless diction and slovenly speech, and lead to the art of speaking and writing correctly. For, after all, accuracy in the use of words is more a matter of habit than of theory, and once it is acquired, it becomes just as easy to speak or to write good English as bad English. It was Chesterfield's resolution not to speak a word in conversation which was not the fittest he could recall. All persons should avoid using words whose meanings they do not know, and with the correct application of which they are unfamiliar. The best spoken and the best written English is that which conforms to the language as used by men and women of culture, a high standard, it is true, but one not so high that it is unattainable by any earnest student of the English tongue. Frank H. Visitelli End of Introduction Section 1 of 15,000 Useful Phrases by Grenville Kleiser by Maria Moravi How to Use His Book The Study of Words phrases, and literary expressions is a highly interesting pursuit. There is a reciprocal influence between thought and language. What we think molds the words we use, and the words we use react upon our thoughts. Hence, a study of words is a study of ideas, and a stimulant to deep and original thinking. We should not, however, study sparkling words and sonorous phrases with the object of introducing them consciously into our speech. To do so would inevitably lead to stiltedness and superficiality. Words and phrases should be studied as symbols of ideas, and as we become thoroughly familiar with them, they will play an unconscious but effective part in our daily expression. We acquire our vocabulary largely from our reading and our personal associates. The words we use are an unmistakable indication of our thought habits, tastes, ideals, and interests in life. In like manner, the habitual language of a people is a barometer of their intellectual, civil, moral, and spiritual ideals. A great and noble people express themselves in great and noble words. Ruskin earnestly counsels us to form the habit of looking intensely at words, we should scrutinize them closely and endeavor to grasp their innermost meaning. There is an indefinable satisfaction in knowing how to choose and use words with accuracy and precision. As Fox once said, I am never at a loss for a word, but Pitt always has the word. All the great writers and orators have been diligent students of words. Demosthenes and Cicero were indefatigable in their study of language. Shakespeare infinite in faculty, took infinite pains to embody his thought in words of crystal clearness. Coleridge once said of him that one might as well try to dislodge a brick from a building with one's forefinger as to omit a single word from one of his finest passages. Milton, master of majestic prose, under whose touch words became as living things. Flaubert, who believed there was one and only one best word with which to express a given thought. De Quincey, who exercised a weird-like power over words. Ruskin, whose rhythmic prose enchanted the ear. Keats, who brooded over phrases like a lover. Newman, of pure and melodious style. Stevenson, forever in quest of the scrupulously precise word. Tennyson, 
graceful and exquisite as the limpid stream. Emerson, of trenchant and epigrammatic style, Webster, whose virile words sometimes weighed a pound, and Lincoln, of simple Saxon speech. All these illustrious men were assiduous in their study of words. Many persons of good education unconsciously circumscribe themselves within a small vocabulary. They have a knowledge of hundreds of desirable words which they do not put into practical use in their speech or writing. Many, too, are conscious of a poverty of language, which engenders in them a sense of timidity and self-depreciation. The method used for building a large vocabulary has usually been confined to the study of single words. This has produced good results, but it is believed that eminently better results can be obtained from a careful study of words and expressions, as furnished in this book, where words can be examined in their context. It is intended and suggested that this study should be pursued in connection with, and as a supplement to, a good standard dictionary. Fifteen minutes a day devoted to this subject, in the manner outlined, will do more to improve and enlarge the vocabulary than an hour spent in desultory reading. There is no better way in which to develop the mental qualities of clearness, accuracy, and precision, and to improve and enlarge the intellectual powers generally, than by regular and painstaking study of judiciously selected phrases and literary expressions. End of section 1. This recording is in the public domain. Section 2 of 15,000 Useful Phrases by Granville Kleiser Plan of Study First, examine the book in a general way to grasp its character, scope, and purpose. Carefully note the following plan of classification of the various kinds of phrases, and choose for initial study a section which you think will be of the most immediate value to you. 1. Useful Phrases 2. Significant Phrases 3. Felicitous phrases. 4. Impressive phrases. 5. Prepositional phrases. 6. Business phrases. 7. Literary expressions. 8. Striking similes. 9. Conversational phrases. 10. Public speaking phrases. 11. Miscellaneous phrases. There are many advantages in keeping before you a definite purpose in your study of this book. A well-defined plan will act as an incentive to regular and systematic effort, and incidentally develop your power of concentration. It is desirable that you set apart a certain convenient time each day for this study. Regularity tends to produce maximum results. As you progress with this work, your interest will be quickened, and you will realize the desirability of giving more and more time to this important subject. When you have chosen a section of the book which particularly appeals to you, begin your actual study by reading the phrases aloud. Read them slowly and understandingly. This tends to impress them more deeply upon your mind, and is in itself one of the best and most practical ways of acquiring a large and varied vocabulary. Moreover, the practice of fitting words to the mouth rapidly develops fluency and facility of speech. Few persons realize the great value of reading aloud. Many of the foremost English stylists devoted a certain period regularly to this practice. Cardinal Newman read aloud each day a chapter from Cicero as a means of developing his ear for sentence rhythm. Rufus Choate, in order to increase his command of language, and to avoid sinking into mere empty fluency, read aloud daily, during a large part of his life, a page or more from some great English author. As the writer has said, the practice of storing the mind with choice passages from the best prose writers and poets, and thus flavoring it with the essence of good literatures, is one which is commended both by the best teachers and by the example of some of the most celebrated orators who have adopted it would signal success. The study should be pursued with a pencil in hand, so that you may readily underscore phrases which make a special appeal to you. The free use of a pencil in marking significant parts of a book is good evidence of thoroughness. This, too, will facilitate your work of subsequent review.
The habit of regularly copying, in your own handwriting, one or more pages of phrases will be of immense practical value. This exercise is a great aid in developing a facile English style. The daily use of the pen has been recommended in all times as a valuable means of developing oral and literary expression. A helpful exercise is to pronounce a phrase aloud and then fit it into a complete sentence of your own making. This practice gives added facility and resourcefulness in the use of words. As an enthusiastic student of good English, you should carefully note striking and significant phrases or literary expressions which you find in your general reading. These should be set down in a notebook reserved for this exclusive purpose. In this way, you can prepare many lists of your own and thus greatly augment the value of this study. The taste for beauty, truth, and harmony in language can be developed by a careful study of well-selected phrases and literary expressions as furnished in this book. A good literary style is formed principally by daily study of great English writers, by careful examination of words in their context, and by a discriminating use of language at all times. Granville Kleiser, New York City, July, 1917 End of section 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of 15,000 Useful Phrases by Grenville Kleiser Useful Phrases Abandoned Hope Abated Pride Abbreviated Visit Abhorred Thraldom Abiding Romance Abject Submission Abjured Ambition Able Strategist Abnormal Talents Abominably perverse. Abounding happiness. Abridged statement. Abrogated law. Abrupt transition. Absolutely irrevocable. Absorbed reverie. Abstemious diet. Abstract character. Abstruse reasoning. Absurdly dangerous. Abundant opportunity. Abusive epithet. Abysmally apologetic. Academic rigor. Accelerated progress. Accentuated playfulness. Accepted littleness. Accessible pleasures. Accessory circumstances. Accidental lapse. Accommodating temper. Accomplished ease. Accredited agent. Accumulated burden. Accurate appraisement. Accursed enemy. Accusing glance. Accustomed lucidity. Aching desire. Acknowledged authority. Acoustical effects. Acquired timidity. Acrid controversy. Acrimonious warfare. Actively zealous. Actualized ideals. Acutely conscious. Adamantine rigidity. Adaptive wit. Adduced facts. Adequate execution. Adhesive quality. Administered rebuke. Admirable reserve. Admissible evidence. Admittedly inferior. Admonitory gesture. Adolescent youth. Adorable vanity. Adroit flatterer. Adelated stranger. Adventitious way. Adventurous mind. Adverse experience. Affably accommodating. Affected indifference. Affectionate approval. Affianced lady. Affirmative attitude. Affluent language. Affrighted slave. 
Aggravated faults. Aggregate body. Aggressive selfishness. Agile mind. Agitated imagination. Agonizing appeal. Agreeable frankness. Aimless confusion. Airy splendor. Alarming rapidity. Alert acceptance. Algebraic brevity. Alien splendor. Alleged reluctance. Allegorical vein. Allied subjects. Alliterative suggestion. All pervading influence. Alluring idleness. Alternating opinion. Altogether dissimilar. Altruistic ideal. Amatory effusions. Amazing artifice. Ambidextrous assistant. Ambiguous grimace. Ambitious project. Ambling pedestrian. Ambrosial essence. Amiable solicitude. Amicable arrangement. Amorous youth. Ample culture. End of section 3. This recording is in the public domain. Section 4 of 15,000 Useful Phrases Amusing Artlessness Analogous Example Analytical Survey Ancestral Creed Ancient Garb Angelic Softness Angry Protestations Anguished Entreaty Angular Features Animated Eloquence Annoying Complications Animalist Appearance Anonymous Benefactor Answering Response Antagonistic Views Antecedent Facts Anticipated Attention Antiquated Prudery Anxious Misgiving Apathetic Greeting Aphoristic Wit Apish Agility Apocalyptic Vision Apocryphal Lodger Apologetic Explanation Apostrophic Dignity Appalling Difficulties Apparent Significance Appealing Picture Appointed Function A Posit Illustration Appreciable Relief Appreciative Fervor Apprehensive Dread Apprentice Touch Appropriate Designation Approving Smile Approximately Correct Aptly Suggested Arbitrarily Imposed Arch Conspirator Arched Embrasure Archaeological Pursuits Architectural Grandeur Ardent Protest Arduous Quest Arid Formula Aristoc Aristocratic Lineage Aromatic Fragrance Errant Trifling Arrested Development Arrogant Imposition Artful Adaptation Artificial Suavity Artistic elegance, artless candor, ascending supremacy, ascetic devotion, ascribed productiveness, aspiring genius, assembled arguments, asserted activity, assiduously cultivated, assimilative power, assumed humiliation, assuredly enshrined, astonishing facility. Astounding mistakes, astute observer, athletic prowess, atmospheric vagueness, atoning sacrifice, atrocious expression, atrophied view, attending circumstances, attentive deference, attenuated sound, attested loyalty, attractive exordium, audacious mendicant, Audible in intimations, augmented force, august tribunal, auspicious moment, austere charm, authentic indications, authoritative critic, autobiographical pages, 
autocratic power, automatic termination, autumnal skies, auxiliary aids, available data, avaricious eyes, avenging fate, average excellence, averted calamity, avowed intention, awakened curiosity, odd devotion, awful dejection, awkward dilemma, axiomatic truth, azure sky. End of section 4. This recording is public domain. Section 5 of 15,000 Useful Phrases Babbling Gossip Bacchanalian Desires Bachelor Freedom Bad Omen Baffled Sagacity Balanced Capacity Baldly Described Baleful Glances Balmy Fragrance Bandying Talk Baneful Impression Banished Silence Barbarous statecraft, barefaced appeal, barest commonplaces, barren opportunities, base intrigue, intrigues, baseless assumptions, bashful modesty, basic principles, battered witticism, beaming countenance, bearish rudeness, beatific vision, beautiful modesty, beckoning horizon, becoming diffidence. Bedraggled wretch, befitting honor, beggarly flimsiness, beguiling voice, belated acknowledgment, belittling fears, bellicose humanity, beneficent career, benevolent regard, benighted sense, benignant pity, beseeching gesture, besetting heresy, besotted fanaticism, bestial ferocity, Bewildering maze, bewitching airs, beyond peradventure, bibulous diver diversions, bigoted contempt, binding obligation, bitter recrimination, bizarre apparel, blackening west, blameless indolence, blanched desolation, bland confidence, blank misgivings, blasphemous hypocrisy, blatant discourse, Blazing audacity, blazoned shield, bleak loneliness, blended impression, blessed condolence, blighted happiness, blind partisan, blissful consciousness, blistering satire, blithe disregard, bloated equivalent, bloodless creature, bloodthirsty malice, blundering discourtesy, blunt rusticity, blurred vision, Blustering assertion, boastful positiveness, bodily activity, boisterous edification, bold generalization, bombastic prating, bookish precision, boon companion, boorish abuse, bored demeanor, borrowed grace, bottomless abyss, boundless admiration, bountiful supply, boyish appreciation, braggart pretense, bravely vanquished, braying trumpet, brazen importunity, breathless eagerness, brief tenure, briefless barrister, bright interlude, brilliant embodiment, brisk energy, bristling temper, temper brittle sarcasm, broadening fame, broken murmurs, brooding peace, brutal composure, bubbling frivolities, bucolic cudgeling, budding joy, bulky figure, buoyant pluck, burdensome business, burly strength, burning zeal, bursting laugh, busily engrossed, business acumen, bygone period. End of section 5. This recording is public domain.